So welcome to the overview of Spring and Spring Boot, which are the middleware frameworks we're going to be using, the middleware platforms we're going to be using as the basis for a lot of the programming assignments in this course and, and just the overall conceptual learning. So in this overview lesson, I want to give you a good feeling for the structure and functionality for Spring Boot. So Spring is a dependency injection framework and it also contains what's known as an inversion of control container that's used to develop web apps on the Java platform. There's other languages supported too, but we're going to be focusing on Java here. What is dependency injection? You'll hear a lot about that. You'll get a lot of chance to play around with it. Some of you probably are already using this in your, your jobs, but it's basically a technique in which an object or a service receives other objects and other services that it depends on. And basically it's a way to kind of have like this external force come along and wire together or configure the implementations that are expected by other components in the system or other objects or services. The other concept that's very closely related to dependency injection, although they are not one and the same, is inversion of control, sometimes known as IOC. And this is a way of, it's an architectural pattern for structuring modern applications using frameworks where the framework runs the main execution thread or the main execution threads, depending of course on, on various factors. Spring actually contains a whole bunch of different things. It's a, a very large project. It contains many, many, many different pieces. We're going to focus on something called Spring Boot 2.0. And you'll see here that that consists of a couple different pieces. It's got something that's called a reactive stack which will be kind of the later focus in the course. It's got something called the servlet stack, which will be the initial focus of the course. And the goal of all this infrastructure is to make it easier to create standalone production grade or production quality web-based applications. And you'll see that it's, it's actually pretty easy to do that, especially to get started. Now, let me just walk through the different stages or architectural elements that make up the spring boot infrastructure or platform. Uh, obviously you have clients and those clients can be browsers, they can be mobile clients, they can be standalone clients, they can be console-based clients, et cetera, et cetera. So we don't really care what the clients are. For the purposes of the class, we're going to use some mobile apps developed in Android to be clients. And then we'll also have some kind of console-based clients using tools like curl and postman and so on to actually run requests to generate requests that go from the client over to the server or servers or services. By default, the communication in spring uses HTTP. No big surprise there. I think everybody is very familiar with what HTTP is. For those of you who have been living in a cave for the last 20, 30 years, HTTP is a request response protocol that packs up messages, sends them over with some headers and some information encoded in various ways, and then waits for a response to come back. So there's basically a, it's kind of the core of a client server computing model. And the way that Spring works is it has something called a controller, and we'll look at that in a little bit more detail here shortly. And that is used to map incoming requests via the HTTP protocol, the hypertext transfer protocol, to so-called endpoint methods that handle the requests. Now, as we'll see that the controller logic and the endpoint methods in the controller typically don't really handle the requests per se. Instead, they pass them off to something called the service layer, which is really where the business logic resides. And that's the business logic that operates on the data that's sent to and received from the data access layer on the server side and the client on the sender side. And we'll see that the, the bulk of the, the, the real code that we write, especially code using all kinds of interesting concurrency techniques and um, reactive programming and functional programming and object-oriented programming and so on, those things really reside in the service layer. That's kind of the master of ceremonies for a lot of this stuff. Now, the way that this works is that controllers typically depend on services to do their bidding. And they're typically connected to each other, controllers connected to the services that 
implement its, its endpoint methods automatically by using dependency injection. So dependency injection is the means by which various fields and various service implementations get wired together. And I'll talk a lot more about that and you'll see lots of examples. There's also typically a, a model layer, which is used to provide access to persistent data. And there's a whole slew of different ways that this gets done. You can use the Java persistence architecture, the JPA. There's some other cool things we'll talk about later that go above and beyond what the JPA does. But basically there are ways of being able to access persistent data with some type of object oriented or functional or reactive veneer that you use to have your services interact with the data. And, and that's one of the real powerful aspects of Spring, as you'll see. The interactions that take place between the controller and the service layer and the model are typically just good old Java calls, assuming you're doing the Java version of all this stuff. Whereas the calls that go from the client into the controller, of course, are done by HTTP. And there's, there's all kinds of different variants of this that we'll get into when we get further along. This is just kind of a high level view. So that's the end of the overview of Spring and Spring Boot. So that'll give you kind of a starting point to see architecturally the kinds of things we're going to be having fun playing around with.